Hi everyone, this video is part four of the 1B series on sleep and sensation from the Biological Basis of Behavior unit for AP Psychology students. This video lesson will cover the ear and hearing. Judging by our unit outline, you can see that we are close to the end of unit one. Today, our video comes from our section on sensation labeled 1.6, and our focus is hearing. These are the three key focus questions that will be covered in the video today. They will outline the major themes of the content covered in today's video. By the end, you should be able to answer all three. These are the essential concepts that are related to the ear and hearing that will be covered in today's video lesson. By the end, you should be able to define and describe them. So let's begin with sound. Sound waves are vibrations in the air that travel in waves and are captured by our ears, which enables us to hear. These waves are characterized by their wavelength and amplitude. Wavelength refers to the distance between the two peaks of a sound wave, and this determines the pitch of the sound. A shorter wavelength means a higher pitch, like a whistle, while a longer wavelength means a lower pitch, like a drum. Amplitude refers to the height of the sound wave and determines the loudness of the sound. A taller wave means a louder sound, like a shout, and a shorter wave means a quieter sound, like a whisper. Together, the wavelength and the amplitude of sound waves allows us to perceive different tones and volumes, helping us understand and interact with the world around us. So now let's talk about the hearing system as a whole. This is referred to as the auditory sensory system, which is responsible for hearing or audition. And this allows us to detect and process sounds from our environment. It starts with a sound wave and enters the outer ear, making vibrations when hitting the eardrum. Vibrations from the eardrum are transmitted through the middle ear to the inner ear where they are converted to electrical signals. These signals are sent to the brain, specifically the thalamus, which then transfers it to be processed by the temporal lobe where it's understood and recognized as sounds. This complex system enables us to detect and differentiate and respond to a wide range of sounds, allowing us to communicate, be alerted when we're in danger, and then enrich our overall experience with music and other sensory stimuli. So as you can see in the blue text box at the bottom of the screen, the College Board's objective is for students to have a general understanding of the structures and functions of the auditory sensory system, but there are no specific parts mentioned. So I thought it was important that you knew you don't necessarily need to memorize the anatomy of the ear, but rather explain the general process. So I've selected a few parts that I think are important that I will put at the top of the screen that I will use um, in my description. And I I have them there for you to use as a reference. I also want to mention that the visual I'm using comes from an advertisement for a hearing aid company called the Miracle Ear, and I think they do a fantastic job at showing a visual representation of the auditory system. So now let's go through the process of hearing. This begins with sound waves, which are vibrations that travel through the ear from a sound making source like someone talking or music playing, and the outer part of the ear, which is shaped like a funnel, is called the pinna, and this is what catches the sound waves and guides them into the ear canal. This part of the ear is important for directing and amplifying the sound waves into the ear. The ear canal is the tube that concentrates and guides the sound waves further into the ear. At the end of the ear canal is the eardrum, which is a thin, flexible membrane that seals the outer ear from the middle ear. The eardrum is also called the tympanic membrane, and it vibrates as sound waves strike it. Inside the middle ear are three tiny bones that are also called together the ossicles. The vibrations of the eardrum are transferred to these tiny bones. They are called the anvil, the hammer, and the stirrup. The hammer is first. It is also referred to as the malleus, and it is what is attached to the eardrum. The hammer moves when the eardrum vibrates. And next is the anvil that's also called the incus, and the anvil receives vibrations from the hammer and passes them to the stirrup. The stirrup, which is also called the stapes, transfers these vibrations to the oval window of the cochlea. This process has taken us from the outer ear to the middle ear, and on the next slide, we'll continue the process into the inner ear. So now we're in the inner ear and we're focusing on a structure called the cochlea. The cochlea is a spiral shaped fluid filled structure in the inner ear that looks a little bit like a snail shell. There's an opening to the cochlea called the oval window and the oval window is sealed by a small membrane. 
when the stirrup vibrates against the oval window, it creates waves in the fluid inside of the cochlea. As the fluid moves in the cochlea, it creates waves that travel along the basilar membrane. Inside the cochlea, the basilar membrane vibrates in response to the fluid waves. Stereocilia, or cilia, are tiny hair cells on the top of the basilar membrane. When the basilar membrane vibrates, the cilia bend, and this bending action causes the hair cells to generate electrical signals. This is where transduction occurs, where the vibrations are converted into an electrical signal that can pass through the nervous system. The electrical signals are carried through the auditory nerve to the thalamus and then to the brain's auditory cortex in the temporal lobe, where they're processed and interpreted as recognizable sounds. This is an overview of the structures and functions of the auditory system. So now that you understand the structures, and how they function as a part of the auditory sensory system, as well as how sound waves become vibrations and are converted into electrical signals, you will be able to understand pitch theories. The College Board wants AP Psychology students to be able to explain three pitch theories. The first is called place theory. Now the place theory is like it sounds, it has to do with the place in which the sound waves cause the most vibration within the cochlea. Now remember that the cochlea is coiled, but imagine unrolling it and stretching it out flat like the image on the screen. Think of it kind of like a long piano keyboard stretched out inside of your ear. Now according to the pitch theory, different parts of the cochlea cochlea respond to different frequencies or pitches of sound. High pitched sounds make the base of the cochlea vibrate more, whereas low pitched sounds make the tip of the cochlea vibrate more. Therefore, the brain can figure out the pitch by identifying where the vibrations are the strongest. So to summarize, the place theory is when pitch is determined by the location of the vib vibration in the cochlea. The frequency theory proposes that the rate at which a neuron fires its signals matches the frequency of the sound wave. So for low frequency sounds, the entire basilar membrane vibrates in sync with the sound wave, causing the neurons to fire at a rate that matches the frequency of the sound. For example, if a sound wave has a frequency of 200 hertz, the auditory nerve fibers would fire at 200 times per second. So imagine neurons in your ear like drummers. When a low pitch sound comes in, the neurons or the drummers beat slowly. When a high pitch sound comes in, they beat quickly. The brain counts these beats and figures out the pitch based on the speed of the drumming or the neurons firing. So to summarize the frequency theory, the rate of neural firing matches the frequency of the sound wave, and this is how the brain interprets the pitch. The next pitch theory is the volley theory. The volley theory suggests that groups of neurons or nerve cells work together to send information about sound frequencies to the brain. So here's how it works. Think of it like a relay race where several neurons or several runners take turns passing the baton or the sound information. This theory is suggesting that a single neuron can't send signals fast enough for high pitch sounds. So instead, multiple neurons take turns firing, creating a combined signal. So as you can see on the diagram on the screen, the rapid wave showing the high pitch sound is replicated by four neurons alternating their firing so that they can send the signal fast enough to represent the high pitch sound. This team effort allows the brain to interpret higher pitches that allow that a single neuron itself could not handle. So to summarize the volley theory is that groups of neurons work together to send higher frequency sound information. So next is sound localization. If you were to close your eyes and listen to the sounds in your surrounding, you would likely be able to point in the direction of the sounds and fairly accurately locate the direction of the sound makers. This is because you have sound localization, and this is the ability to identify the location of a sound. And this is how it works. Both of your ears, if they are functioning normally, will use two factors to help identify the location of a sound. Time difference from ear to ear and loudness difference. Imagine with your eyes closed, you were to hear a clap. 
if the clap is coming from your right side, it will reach your right ear a little bit sooner than it will reach your left ear. So your brain notices the time lag and figures out that the sound is coming from the right because it reached your right ear slightly sooner than your left ear. Additionally, that same clap will be louder in your right ear than your left ear because your head blocks some of the sound to your left ear. Your brain also uses this loudness difference to help determine the direction of the sound. You can use one ear to localize sound, but it's much harder and much less effective than what you can do with both of your ears together. Your outer ear, as you learned, is the pinna, has a unique shape and it changes the sound slightly depending on where it's coming from, above, below, in front, and behind. Your brain uses these changes to understand the sound's position. So the important takeaway here is that one, your brain uses multiple cues to determine the location of sound. And the two main factors are relying on the time difference from ear to ear and the loudness difference from ear to ear. So finally, I will close with a short description of the different types of hearing loss and deafness. There are two broad types of hearing loss and deafness that are categorized by the specific location of the ear that's affected, which is causing the hearing deficiency. So you can see on the diagram that there is conduction deafness. It's also called conductive deafness. And this refers to the hearing loss that's a result of the impairments of the outer and middle ear. These are the parts that conduct sound waves into vibrations through the ear. Then there are types of deafness and hearing loss that are a result of impairment to the inner ear, where the vibrations are converted into electrical signals. And these types of hearing deficiencies are referred to as sensory neural. There are many different reasons for each type of hearing loss and deafness. Some are permanent, some happen because of damage, sometimes they occur naturally over time, and some cases people are born with them. I won't cover every single type of hearing loss and deafness in each category, but I'll share a few common types. Let's start with conductive hearing loss and deafness. When sound waves are not effectively conducted into the ear, where they can be processed. This can be due to blockages in the ear, infections, structural issues that impede the movement of sound, and common causes are ear infections, um, something in the ear that's stuck, earwax buildup, perforation of the eardrum, or a malformation of a part of the middle ear or outer ear. Sensory neural hearing loss usually affects the hair cells in the cochlea that turn vibrations into impulses or occurs when there is a defect or damage to the auditory nerve fibers that carry the nerve impulse. Aging and exposure to loud sounds over time can damage the hair cells and make it difficult for them to convert sounds. Some genetics disease and head trauma can also affect the cochlea in the auditory nerve, causing sensory neural deafness. Hearing aids can be worn outside of the ear to amplify sound going into the ear, and cochlear implants that sit on the side of the head behind the ear detect sound on the outside of the ear and then transmit electrical signals directly into the cochlea. As I noted here, the College Board's objective for students is to be able to identify the broader types of hearing loss, um, as well well as some general causes like aging and damage to the structures of the auditory system. So let's finish today's video with a few questions for review. Remember to pause the video after the question to determine the answer. And then at the end of the video, I'll display the correct answers for you to check. Question number one says, when Yaroslav listens to music, the sound waves cause which of the following to vibrate first? Question number two says, your friend is playing the low notes on her tuba quite loudly. Which of the following best explains the physical properties of the sound waves? Question number three says, Dr. Sisme wants to conduct a study in which she examines sensory neural hearing loss. Which of the following would be an appropriate operational definition for her variable of interest? So this concludes part four, hearing. After completing this video, you should be able to answer our key focus questions as well as define and describe our vocabulary terms at the bottom of the screen.